people who thought they were cool would sort of cut in line and be like, this is my stall. I remember there's this one guy who was like a dealer and he was a sort of ballet dancer and he would like, when a door, when a bathroom door would open, he'd throw his leg up and block anybody else from going in with a leg like up above people's heads and be like, it's mine, bitch. What's up, YouTube? You want to know about my life as a club kid in Berlin, going to Berghain every weekend, going to the techno parties. Disclaimer, I am seven years sober almost, and I in no way condone or glorify drug use, and that's not what I'm interested in doing in this video. What I am interested in doing is shedding a little light on the underground scene. Three things you might not know about what it was like for somebody like me living in that kind of scene. So the first thing is ego. It was incredibly important to me and my identity that I was able to get into Berghain. And I knew how to get into Berghain and I always got in except for two times. And I said every weekend there and I had all these people that I knew inside and like, it was so important that I maintained that identity. I go to Berghain and I get in without, uh, without waiting into the line. You know, I'm, I'm permanent guest list, which like, I don't even know if that's a thing, but people would like skip the line. And sometimes if you dress in this fabulous outfit, you could kind of just skip the line and they treat you like royalty. But I also remember that some of my friends who would go every weekend and they were like super well known in the scene and they were regulars, sometimes the guards would, the, the, the bouncers would reject them once in a blue moon just to cut them down to size, you know, just to take them down a peg and just to keep this like mystique around the door, door selection process. They'd just say, leider nicht, nicht, heute nicht, you know, sorry, not tonight. You know, next time maybe, you need a break. They, the guards even said, you need a break. You're banned for a few weeks, get yourself together. Cause they would see them like all, you know, high and messy or something like that. So there was this like ego relationship with the guards where, you know, the guards by letting people in would kind of grant them this like this cultural clout. You know, I got into bad kind, I know how to get in. And, um, and, and people really wielded that and weaponized that, you know? Uh, and there was a big culture of like, oh, do you know somebody who works there who can get you in off the list? So you don't have to deal with that situation of whether you're selected or not. The next thing is that I was terrified. I was terrified of the door selection process. There was so much fear in my life. Every time I walked up to that thing, which, you know, the, the metal gate, every time I walked up to it, I would shake. I would start shaking and I would tell myself, play it cool, play it cool, play it cool. I remember I was like, I don't believe in God, but I'm praying because I'm so scared right now. And I was scared of them telling me that I wasn't cool enough, that I didn't belong, you know? And, um, and I would just tell myself like, okay, you know, act, act casual. I, I practiced, you know, I spoke enough German pretty quickly that I learned how to answer simple questions because they'd ask you like, wie alt bist du? How old are you? And I would say like, 22, whatever, 22. Um, sometimes they'd ask like who you were there to see. Like, so I would memorize at least one person who was like DJing that night. Um, and I even had this, like, th I told myself if I was ever rejected, I'd give them this answer, which is like, aber ich bin die Hausfrau. Like, but I'm the, but I'm the woman of the house tonight, or I'm the, I'm the housewife, which like, I never had to say that, but you know, I was so scared. I, I did whatever I could to like prepare mentally for the possibility that I would be challenged. So what's the door selection process like? So you get to the front and they usually kind of wave a hand like, okay, wait. And so you're just standing there and waiting. And like, um, I couldn't even tell which of the guards was making the selection. Apparently only some of them are allowed to select or reject, but it's all happening through like very subtle eye contact cues. And your job when you're standing there is just to like stand there and play it cool. And like, I would just be like, don't do anything. Just stand there and look at them and just be really open and like try to project a sense of like confidence. Um, but inside I was terrified every single time. And then when I'd get inside, the shakes would be like, you know, kind of subsiding. And then that was what powered me to like, then go into the bathrooms to like try to find somebody to hang out with or try to find some illicit substances or whatever. It was like that anxiety turned into like exhilaration. The third thing that I want to say is that my life was very dangerous. And I don't mean in terms of violence necessarily, I mean in terms of the types of decisions people were making with their bodies. I had one friend who had a seizure at the club um, and then she was so terrified that like authorities would be notified that she refused to get help and, um, and none of us knew what to do. I've seen people completely collapse and go unconscious. I've seen people engaging in sex acts where it seemed like 
it, possibly they weren't fully conscious themselves. It was a really scary place for me. Maybe not for everybody, but for me. You know, I myself mixed uppers and downers and all sorts of different substances that are like potentially lethal to mix, you know? And I flirted with the edge. There was one night, it wasn't at bad kind, but there was one night when like, I had mixed some things that I remember soon after I realized I shouldn't have mixed those things and I was afraid that I wasn't, that I was gonna lose consciousness. One of the scariest drugs that was around me and that, you know, I definitely partook in was GHB, which, you know, it creates this sense of euphoria and this sense of physical charge. People use it in a sexual context a lot. We're talking in terms of like milliliters in a pipette and just a little too much could be enough to kill you or could be enough to make you unconscious so that you die from some other reason. Um, and then mixing with alcohol is even more dangerous. Uh, and people, myself included, were doing that all the time, not even keeping track, just mixing whatever. You know, we'd file into the bathroom, and then the bathrooms were this whole, like, you know, in Mean Girls, when they go through the cafeteria and show you all the different crews, like in the bathrooms in Bad Kind, they were always packed to the brim, so packed that you couldn't even, like, find a space to stand. And uh, there was this kind of hierarchy where, like, people who thought they were cool would sort of cut in line and be like, this is my stall. I remember there's this one guy who was, like, a dealer, and he was a sort of ballet dancer, and he would, like, when a door, when a bathroom door would open, he'd throw his leg up and block anybody else from going in with a leg like up above people's heads and be like, it's mine, bitch. Uh, so that was the culture inside. And then, you know, you're if you're lucky enough to like get a spot in line and get into the bathroom, eight people file in with you. You're packed to the brim with all these people and you know, drugs are coming out and maybe people are sharing or maybe not, or maybe it's two different groups and you're each doing your own substances or whatever. And like people would pass around the GHB pipette and like GHB burns your mouth. So we would like hold a little bit of soda in our mouth and squeeze it in and then swallow it all together so that we didn't burn our, burn our throats on the way down. You know, you would see these like 18, 19 year olds taking these huge amounts of GHB. And it was just like, oh my God, this is really flirting with the edge. I hope I've communicated a little bit of the fear, anxiety, and excitement that all mixed together and created this culture of like, oh my God, I have to spend every weekend there. I have lots more stories to tell about Bad Kind. If you wanna know more, let me know in the comments. Tell me what you wanna hear. I can tell you about DJ sets. I can tell you about the architecture. I can tell you about more of the interpersonal culture. I can tell you about the lights, the situation with the lights DJ. I mean, there were so many amazing, epic things about the design of that space that for me were unfortunately undermined by the fact that it was actually like a really negative interpersonal experience for me, which I only realized years after the fact. And I've been back since, I've been back sober a couple of times and it was fun, you know, it was fine. But after about half an hour, I had had enough. Whereas back when I used to go there as a kind of addict, I would spend eight to 12 hours there reliably, sometimes more, sometimes 20 hours. Uh, people would compete for like how long they could stay. It's very strange. If you want more videos like this, you should tell me, because if you don't tell me, then I won't know, and then I won't make more videos like this. It's an experiment. But I Googled Berghain and nightlife in Germany, and I didn't find many videos of like people really from inside the experience sharing about it. So, thanks.